Thank you. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be here today. I think it's all too rarely that we stop and, um, and think about and appreciate items and resources that are very often taken for granted, uh, such as GenBank. I, um, I was just thinking about this um, a moment ago. I spent my high school years in a Quaker school and was subjected to Quaker meeting, um, which I quickly learned to appreciate greatly. And one of the, uh, the features of Quaker meeting is that um, when it so moves anyone to stand up and speak about something they feel strongly about, they do so, and then everyone has a chance to, to uh, ponder and think in, in quiet and solitude with a large number of people around you. And um, I would almost propose that we we now stop and, and spend um, a good 15 or 20 minutes uh, pondering what was just said. But instead, I'm going to um, present you a 1,000 PowerPoint slides in, in hopes of um, one good phrase. And I probably won't even come up with that. About 300 years ago, uh, this gentleman began what has, um, has now been a tradition of looking within, uh, looking for signs of life in places that uh, one might not expect them. It was uh, soon after the invention of the, of the microscope. And von Leeuwenhoek uh, drew these pictures as part of that effort. Uh, at 1683, this is the famous letter number 39, describing for the first time what he thought might be small life forms animalcules, he called them, that inhabited um, his mouth and, and others that he could persuade to hold still while he um, scraped and picked. And part of the evidence for uh, concluding that these forms were alive was the observation that they, um, they halted their motion when he subjected them to noxious conditions like coffee um, or heat, I suppose. Um, these kinds of observations, these morphologic observations, were, were the basis for discrimination and classification of these small life forms and, and their forms of motion as well. And there was, there was a new appreciation for a world of diversity that, again, hadn't been previously recognized. We now have more than 100 years of uh, cultivation capability uh, from which many of these small life forms were allowed to um, make themselves known in, in other ways through their behavior in what is really, of course, a set of artificial conditions in the laboratory. But yet, from these many, many observations of life forms from within animals and humans in particular, we now have a much greater appreciation for what they might be doing with us, for us, and because of us, and have come to realize that in many ways we can't live without these small inhabitants. Um, in some ways, this effort to understand the, the benefits and features of these indigenous microbial communities is also a, a somewhat egocentric effort to understand more about ourselves. But as we learn about the complexity of these communities, we realize, of course, that many of the lessons and principles have been and will be mirrored in the communities of life that lie outside as well. So many of the points I'm going to tell you about over the next uh, several minutes are really lessons learned again in many uh, cases uh, through ways that, that Dr. Brenner just outlined, um, rediscovering a principle or a feature through a different kind of lens or in a different place for a different purpose. This list of benefits, of course, is, is um, evolving. It's alive in the sense that it's incomplete and yet um, still being refined and, and understood better. So the goals of, of work that that would be directed at examining and under, trying to understand these communities would have, in part, the purpose of trying to understand better what is health, what is human physiology, why and when does it go awry, 
as well as the, the features of, of what are really some very complex symbiotic relationships. Many of the quests have embedded in them the idea that we might be able to predict future phenotypes of host or host-associated uh, symbiosis. And there are many questions, of course, that are contained within this kind of goal, part of which is perhaps mirrored in yesterday's um, presentations. But in this sense, when we talk about components, we're not talking about, of course, genes or proteins or, um, or genome loci, but rather pieces of a complex community which makes up a unit of study, a microbial community. How do these components determine the behavior of the whole? And how do um, a number of competing factors from environment, from the host's uh, blueprint as well, determine the structure and behavior of these communities? So this means that we have a number of needs and approaches. And I think one of the most simple messages from my perspective is that we are so um, early in this process of trying to even understand the parts list in this case, let alone the more complex structure and space, the patterns that might mean something biologically, the nature of the interactions between these parts. And part of the challenge, of course, is that we don't have the kinds of manipulations that David Botstein spoke about yesterday. We can't knock out a member of a community in situ today. We can replace one, perhaps in a very crude fashion, sometimes called probiotics. But we know that these methods are still very imprecise and not, um, and not really informed by the, the features of the natural system. So what I'm going to show you are some very early superficial efforts to understand patterns of variation, to begin to address correlation and covariation, and to exploit perturbation, both natural and, and man-made, to understand these complex systems. I spoke a minute about the lens through which one views a world. And of course, von Leeuwenhoek had his early um, microscope lenses. Uh, those who spent all those years cultivating had colonies and and um, behavioral phenotypes from cultivated organisms. And today, we're talking about another lens. It has imperfections, just as the others have before it. This is the lens afforded by sequence. This particular picture is afforded by one particular genetic locus, or sequence. It's the ribosomal RNA. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages, as does any single gene locus. But it has proven to be very useful and, um, and effective for a variety of reasons that we, we can talk about if, uh, if you wish after. So now we use this, um, this lens and begin to look at these very familiar environments uh, within us and ask, what is it that we see now that perhaps we either saw or did not see previously in terms of membership and parts? What are we made of um, if we believe that these communities do, in fact, contribute to who we are and how we operate? Well, this is one of, of what are now a number of studies which teach a few important points, I believe. In contrast to that last picture of the bacterial world with 80 or 100, phylum level uh, taxa, we see many fewer high level or high order taxa um, on the order of phylum. In the human body, there are a handful that at least dominate in terms of their abundance. And you see them here um, as firmicutes divided into two subphyla and bacteroidetes. Great deal of diversity buried within each of these. Uh, but yet a relatively small number of these large groups. I should point out, as of three years ago, still a, a staggering proportion of the life, the microbial life within the human body that has still not yet been cultivated. 
I firmly believe it will be, it, it is being, but um, we simply are not smart enough to know what they see and find and, and, and require within these indigenous environments um, and how we can prov uh, provide those outside in the laboratory. We don't, we don't really understand that. And a great deal is still, is still novel. The story is, is similar, although somewhat distinct in the different habitats uh, or domains of, of the human body. Relatively small numbers of phyla, they're shown here in color. The relative sizes of these circles denotes the, the relative um, size of these communities in terms of species. The numbers are already um, inaccurate, but I think you see the point. Small numbers of these, of these phylum level organizations, at least as defined by ribosomal RNA. Now, I found this a very intriguing observation. We still don't know what it means. But even at this very crude level, phylum, firmicutes, bacteroidetes, there are significant differences in the relative ratios of members within each of these groups dependent upon, in this case, um, the weight status, the, the fat content of the human body. Lean individuals have a smaller ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes, and those that are obese, um, higher ratios. And you can see the ratios trending downward over the course of a year on a diet during which body weight was dropping. What does this mean? Uh, is this simply an epiphenomenon of uh, forces that have nothing to do necessarily with the microorganisms within these um, groups? Or are they somehow contributing to or driving or participating in the process that is en energy extraction from food and diet? We still don't know, but I think five years ago, we wouldn't have even imagined to be looking or asking those sorts of questions. There are some, some interesting features about our communities, those of animals, um, that distinguish them from communities found within the outside world. In some ways, this kind of plot may not be appropriate, but I think it, it serves certain purposes. This is the, the lineage through time or lineage by depth kind of plot in which you look at uh, sequence similarity as a proxy, I guess, for time, perhaps, and um, the number of times you've seen an entity at that, at that um, uh, genetic distance level. In the ribosomal RNA-based world, these numbers are, are fairly significant in terms of um, classification because, uh, roughly speaking, genus might be distinguished at the level of 5% or more, um, and species would be down here. So what we see is a relative abundance of tax at the level of species and a paucity at the level of um, class or higher. And that's the case for these indigenous communities as opposed to those outside. This is another display of the same point. Data that we've curated a little more carefully because, of course, one could be confounded or misled by uh, sequencing errors at, at this level of, of distance. But we think that's probably not the case here. And still see this uptick or hockey stick-like uh, phenomenon, suggesting that our communities are distinguished by their uh, overabundance or um, proliferation, I hate to use that word, but um, overabundance of strains or species. Now again, what does that mean? It is a distinguishing feature. It, it is a way of distinguishing one host from another. Blue, human, red, mouse. The same um, has been done for other host species. It's also a way of distinguishing human individuals. And I'll show you just a little bit of data on that, but there are more that, that one can, can now find. Um, in the, the scientific literature, suggesting that what makes each of us individuals is in part um, associated with a distinct group of strains and perhaps species. Just a, a, a small digression. When we begin to look at other mammals, um, what we find are, again, these uh, clusters or clouds of sequences and strains in the indigenous uh, habitats uh, of the body, mouth, stomach, distal gut, 
um, that are distinct from the sequences that might lie just adjacent to, to the host. This is the dolphin, and this is water that we collected just adjacent to the dolphin's mouth as we were sampling the, uh, the gingival sulcus in the dolphin's mouth. And we have a number of dolphins now from which we've done this. And when you begin to bore in on the features of this tree, it's, it's fascinating. We don't really understand who or what these organisms might be doing, but they clearly are uh, distinct from the outside environment. They're distinct from the strains of species that you would see in other mammals. The dolphin has its own distinct set of communities. Uh, they have intriguing relationships. He new novel helicobacters in the stomach, um, archobacters in the mouth, um, and likewise uh, in the distal gut, large numbers of actinobacillus strains whose biology we simply have no idea about. And that's, of course, the major challenge here is what I'm showing you is based upon this very narrow monochromatic lens, the ribosomal RNA, and what we'd really love to know is the capabilities, the full capabilities of each of these strains and how they are distinguished from each other, and more importantly, why they come together in one community um, that is distinct from another, how they interact and how they participate with host physiology. So the point here is some simple observations about distinct differences in topologies of inferred trees, and I, I'm using this term very loosely in light of the, the last uh, presentation. But if you think about the trees I've shown you from uh, the inferred phyl uh, phylogenies from the outside world, we have a nice, robust, bushy tree, and these are the communities of, of human and other mammals. Lots of twigs, the fronds, a few major branches. You've heard about the importance of understanding um, assemblages. And I'm going to tell you that there's, of course, a long history, a tradition in science of trying to understand spatial relationships of life. <clears throat> and it's, of course, called biogeography, many other terms for it. It has a rich history. I won't attempt to, to summarize. Uh, but it, of course, revolves around both biotic and abiotic factors. And the, the, the question to me as a clinician is, can we learn something about the nature of the spatial organization of life within the human body that has some relevance to health and disease? The first question really is, is there biogeography? So far, perhaps surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, um, most folks have lumped samples together especially from difficult to, to sample or small um, anatomic sites. And so in almost every case, what we know about the human mouth has been learned from pools of samples from multiple sites within a given mouth or even multiple mouths. What we've begun to do is look at different facets of different teeth um, separated by either uh, distance or uh, symmetry in terms of the organization of teeth and the mouth. And we looked at each site separately, although I'm going to show you now the combined data from all sites in, in a given mouth. Because the point I'd like to, to emphasize is the, um, is the uh, staggering unevenness in the relative abundance of groups within these communities. This is binned at the level of genus, and you see this vast um, overabundance of the top 10 genera as opposed to this long tail out here. Look at another person, same shape, different members up here, different genera, although they tend to be the same within the top 10 or 20, you can see that the tails may differ substantially. And the degree of difference in relative abundance is, is also fairly large. Of course, we don't know what this means biologically, but given that it could be important, these sort, this sort of feature must be of course, um, examined and thought about. Well, here are the data on the individual sites. And you might have thought that every tooth has a roughly similar picture. After all, it's bathed in the same saliva, you would think. Um, we brush, we move our tongue around, we swish and whatever we do with our mouths. Um, but yet you can see distinct rank abundance profiles at each tooth that we've sampled, and you can apply all kinds of statistical tests, 
And the message seems to be, so far, that each site is a, um, is a distinctly um, different site, that there is, um, there is biogeography. We don't understand the pattern yet, but it is non-random. Everything is not everywhere, as uh, biogeographers are often interested in, in, um, in testing. And this kind of biogeography may be akin to island biogeography, where the, the assemblages on each of these rocks in this intertidal pool um, is distinct and based upon competing forces, um, some stochastic and some driven by environmental condition, and in this case, driven as well by the force with which waves hits these rocks and the degree to which they turn over as a function of their size, et cetera. Question is, can we apply the principles um, and the understanding of this system to the human mouth? Well, there may be some similarities, um, and yet we still don't understand a lot of the factors. Perhaps there are habitat factors at each of these teeth that we still haven't been able to measure. We do have um, non-homogeneous anatomy in the mouth in terms of where the salivary ducts end and how you hold your toothbrush and uh, a whole lot of other microanatomic issues. Perhaps a lot of this is um, in the early stages of repopulation and reassembly at each two surface. And there may be stochastic events that play a role as well. We know that there could be something important to be learned because disease, in contrast to health, which is I've been showing you, disease does have, have patterning. It's lateral symmetry. This has been learned over many decades through large population-based surveys. And I, I would argue that, that either there is early evidence of this kind of biogeography and health, and our goal is to determine whether that's in fact there or not and can be seen, or it ter may turn out that, um, that health is simply the absence of disease-associated biogeography. And that, too, is important because it helps us predict and define what is health and who will remain healthy um, despite the, the natural forces at, at work here, since 40% of you will develop uh, gum disease, um, either have or will. Just to summarize, uh, we see a few Perhaps they're selected at some level. Of course, community level selection is still something that has not been shown clearly um, with hard information. But we, of course, we as a community feel that it, it, it may take place. But nonetheless, few shallow, wide radiations of life suggesting that maybe there is cooperation between all these little twigs. There's an uneven distribution in these communities. There's limited archaeal diversity, I haven't shown you. So, and it all suggests that it's the community organization that's, that's the real important issue and what we have to get at. We also, of course, tend to lose track of the things that we don't see with whatever lens we're using. Um, in this case, it's obviously um, many cases, many times the rare members of these communities. And yet, we simply turn to macroecology and traditional uh, principles and know that very often, it's the rare members that are the keystone uh, members of a community, without which the community falls apart. There are, of course, a lot of potential sources of variability. Most of these have just not been looked at carefully yet. And I would argue that, although it may feel to some descriptive, there are ways of doing this by taking advantage of of um, the, the natural features of, of humans, human interactions, human behavior, and human disease that would allow this to be done in a way in which uh, some understanding might be gleaned or at least suspected, proposed from the patterns of variation. Some of these have been examined to some degree and, of course, proved to be potentially very important. So I'm going to just now turn to disturbance and disease and, um, and then end with some uh, some points about where the challenges may lie in this kind of, of um, effort. There are many places in the body, human body, animals, where just like in the outside environment, the pathology is due to a, a net collective effect of a disturbed community. In cases of 
chronic periodontitis, it's near impossible to identify one or two or even a handful of organisms that alone explain most cases of disease. Instead, it now appears to be the case that it's, a, it's, a, it's an altered community structure that gives rise to um, this response, this pathology that's elicited in the host. We've looked at, at possible kinds of scenarios for um, a disturbance of this type in the mouth. We know that sometimes disease-associated communities contain um, archaea, and they contain, in fact, very specific kinds of archaea, the methanogens. Uh, in fact, the relative abundance of methanogen ribosomal DNA correlates quite well with severity of disease, but it only holds true for about a third of all people with this disease condition. Well, we know something about the interactions of methanogens with other members of a complex community. Um, this is the model of, of the anaerobic community, where syntrophy is the, the link between these different members and, and a partner, which is producing um, a product from growth that proves to be growth inhibitory for it. It turns out that the product can be consumed in an energetically favorable manner by any of a number of different partners, uh, thereby enhancing life for the, uh, the consumer as well as the producer. And let me just add to the comment that in cases of severe or moderate chronic periodontitis where we don't see methanogens, we see treponemes or we see other organisms. So it may be that this model serves a useful purpose in predicting the kinds of interactions and relationships that would um, define a, a disease-associated community. But it's the notion of community as pathogen that has escaped many of us as clinicians, I think. The list goes on. There, there are many places uh, and settings in which I think this, this idea is, is clearly worthy of study um, and, and further analysis. Chronic periodontitis is, is one clear example, but inflammatory bowel disease, um, even irritable bowel syndrome, and a variety of others. We know that, that um, health-associated communities have the ability to make it harder for pathogens to colonize. Um, this has been learned through animal models and through crude um, experiments of nature in humans. And this is a property that, again, can go awry when a community falls apart or becomes um, disordered. So that raises a number of questions, uh, including how we study and how we can better understand the robustness of, of a community, uh, its ability to both resist change as well as return to its previous state, however you define that, um, and what the role might be of the relatively rare members in the community in this whole um, robustness issue. There are a number of, of ways in which I think we can study this without reducing the complexity too much. And one is taking place every day in, in, in many cases when we take antibiotics. So think about the use of antibiotics today. It's a long continuum or context in which um, of course, antibiotics have been present and yet really not used in the concentrations and the deliberate directed way in which we have used them in the last few seconds of this timeline. We have on the one hand all of these co-evolved benefits that I talked about at the beginning of my presentation and yet these obvious detrimental effects of antibiotic use today. Acute disease in which uh, diarrhea or overgrowth of, a, um, of an organism like Clostridium difficile takes place, chronic disorders that arise from the use of antibiotics, and of course, antibiotic resistance. So here's just one example of the kind of, of observational slash interventional clinical study that might give some insight into how these, com these com uh, communities respond and what determines their, uh, their stability. We have now followed a number of healthy individuals who were then asked to uh, take ciprofloxacin for five days on each of two occasions during the course of a year. 
collected a lot of poop samples, um, have subjected those samples to a number of different uh, analyses, but I'm going to tell you about just one kind of analysis on a very small subset of samples, and that is, uh, again, sequencing. So in this case, we are making a, a, a vain effort to see a little bit beyond where we have been able to see with Sanger-based sequencing, full-length ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, um, by using uh, these next-generation pyrosequencing platforms, 454, et cetera. Um, but the point is to see what might be, if any, added value in looking past the point on the, um, on the coverage curve that we're accustomed to, to being stuck at today in the 80, 85% range. Well, when you look at lots of sequence tags, and these are from two of the different hypervariable regions of this molecule, one sees some relative advantages. Um, the sheer numbers of, of observations allows one to gain greater, greater confidence that you have truly seen something which falls further out on that rank abundance curve, and I'll show you in just a moment. We also know that we're, um, we're finding still a surprising number of sequence types that have not yet been seen. Although, overall, all tags um, uh, uh, considered, there's relatively um, high numbers of, of exact matches with the existing databases in GenBank um, in comparison to Ocean, say. When you talk about unique sequences, we're still at the 6 or 9% level. So we're only um, seeing uh, we're seeing about 90% that has not yet been um, discovered or reported so far. And again, from a, a fairly um, intimate, close environment. This is the, the rank abundance curve I was telling you about. This is um, a 99% confidence um, boundary that would just be determined by classic Poisson um, law, indicating that with full-length sequence and each of these two tag sequencing technologies, um, we have different um, thresholds below which we no longer have reasonable confidence that what we've seen is, is actually going to be seen again when we do a similar study on a similar number of, of um, with similar, similar number of observations. This is where the, um, the tag, sequence take, tag sequencing takes you out to. Likewise, if you had relatively fewer numbers of observations, of course, the res resolving power of a full-length sequence um, gets you a better perch on the number of, of different, um, in this case, OTUs or species-level taxa that you've seen. So this is the full-length coverage after close to 8,000 observations. And here's the number of, of uh, species-level taxes seen with each of the two tags. They don't resolve things as well. But again, the trade-off is in their throughput. When you get out to 500,000, now you've seen many more entities at a given level of, of uh, resolution than you've seen with full-length sequencing. So what do we find in these, in these timelines uh, in these healthy individuals? Well, first of all, um, stepping back, you see the same general phyla, the Bacteroidetes up here, and the Firmicutes down here. You see a lot of uh, genera and species that you've seen before, but again, many species that are distinct, that are less abundant, and it's those species that impart the individuality to each of these small number of different subjects and their communities. 30% of the species level taxa show some significant change in response to ciprofloxacin. It's a somewhat surprising number given that many people have felt the fluoroquinolones to be a class of drugs that should not affect, for example, the vast um, populations of anaerobic organisms, et cetera. But it appears that at least among the more abundant organisms, the effect is of only limited duration. Now, Again, this is ribosomal RNA, and we're not looking at process or function, but it suggests that at least from this superficial point of view, um, things have begun to return by about a month out after this five-day course. What's the cost? The cost is in diversity. The antibiotic has greatly reduced both richness um, and scores of diversity. 
as well as evenness in most individuals. But the effect is, is distinctly different in uh, one of the individuals versus the other two. And you can see that here. This is a, a PCA-like plot of those same data from the V3 tags. Each individual is color-coded, A, B, C, or different individuals. Um, and these are the two axes that, um, that represent the, the two greatest sources of variation. The first axis, counts for about 35%, appears to separate individuals, at least before ciprofloxacin. Now, individuals A and C are less well resolved than either is from person B. And there's no clear or obvious reason for this. In fact, A and C are different genders, different ethnicities, um, living in different places, and different diets. And yet, they appear to be quite similar. B is, is off here. When you look at the, at the points soon after ciprofloxacin, now we see a consistent effect, same direction, and it's towards um, minimizing the differences between individuals. So not to sound simplistic, but antibiotics are simply um, blurring our individuality from the perspective of our microbial communities. Now, what this means, of course, is, is not yet clear. But these are just early days with these data and early days in looking at data with this kind of question in mind. So, I thought I would now just end with a few comments about what I take from this in terms of, of the challenges. As we begin to, to look within and try to understand better um, who we are as, as human beings, as, um, as physiologic um, systems, I hate to use that term perhaps, but um, the question will be, to the degree to which our communities contribute, we're gonna have to be worried about the twigs on these trees of life. Um, and, and what that means is that now with closely related organisms, we're gonna have to be worried more about the quality of sequence, about getting beyond the taxonomic designations and more at what these different strains are, are doing functionally and how they differ, which we know can be um, sizable. This has uh, implications for our computational needs and for, again, the importance of understanding function and not just um, binning things according to taxonomy. We don't yet know at what spatial resolution or scale we need to be sampling or looking at these communities. Just as you heard yesterday from Craig Venter, the, the relevant spatial scale in the ocean is still to be determined. Forrest Rauer at San Diego State is looking at that. But again, it depends on the lens with which you look and what it is you want to know about that place in space and time. But in the human body, we have limitations. We can't take apart a body, at least from someone who's alive, and, and go at it as a good scientist might. When we do take out pieces, we are still not recording perhaps all the relevant clinical metadata, as people like to say, that will be critical in allowing us to interpret what the rest of the information means. And that's something that's going to require scientific partnerships that have not yet been fully realized. There are challenges in the unevenness that I've shown you, and certainly challenges that have to do with the potential disproportionate importance of rare members on occasion and the challenge of, of, um, of cultivation resistance. And I know many of you have been thinking or have heard about approaches. This is where perhaps technology offers this glimmer of, of new ways of picking apart a system. I'm, uh, I'm cautioned by the comments that came uh, before this morning, or earlier this morning, um, but I think only until we can examine the, the parts of this system as we define parts, um, only until we can do that in a, in a targeted and deliberate way will we, uh, will we be able to understand the features of the overall system any better. This is just um, an example of a study from last year looking at single cells from um, the dark biosphere, the, the TM7 phylum, which has no known cultivated members. Finally, there are now more organized efforts to, to undertake an understanding of this sort of system. Um, and I think there are, of course, 
good reasons from the sociology of science to support this kind of effort, but I would only caution that um, the questions and drive and motivation um, of individual investigators and time to sit and think in quiet um, that smaller scale efforts allows um, will also be an important part of, of this effort to understand these complex systems. It's, it's I think, still true today that uh, we seem to know more about the tropical rainforest than we do about our own microbiota. So let me just leave you with a few conclusions. I've shown you some features of microbial diversity. Um, again, it's very early, I, I feel. Uh, but there already are some interesting ideas um, or inferences that can be made from data of this sort. This is an important system. Um, it's, in some ways, a, a supplemental set of genomes. It's um, a part of our meta um, organization or, or organism. These communities might be thought of as units of study, certainly from the point of view of disease as well as the point of view of health. There are other disciplines in science that we have not fully exploited, I think, in this kind of work, um, where there are many lessons that have already been learned, principles and, and theories that might be invoked to understand these complex patterns. And, um, and we still have some very exciting but daunting challenges. Since I showed you uh, some unpublished data, I just want to acknowledge a few people. Les Deflefson is a very gifted microbial ecologist in my lab who's doing that antibiotic study that I've shown you, and it's still very early um, in, in those days. Clara Long, another very gifted postdoctoral fellow who's looking at the biogeography of the mouth. And a variety of collaborators, um, Mitch Sogan and Sue Hughes at the Marine Biological Labs, um, a group at, at the U.S. Navy's Marine Mammal Program in San Diego that has um, gotten very interested in understanding the, the physiology of the dolphin and ways of, of um, preserving health in marine mammals, and, and a variety of other collaborators. So I think I will stop at this point. I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thank you. Go on. Uh, I think there's a huge number of problems with this field. And uh, of course, these are, this is not experimental biology. They're observational or epidemiological studies with a huge number of potentially confounding pre-analytic variables. So, you know, using your example of the biogeography of the oral cavity as an example, you know, how do you deal with the pre-analytic variables? What are the controls? Why aren't you using an experimental model where you can control those pre-analytic variables or minimize their potential impact? A lot of questions around this. I, I, will, not, um, I will not deny that there are perhaps um, a daunting set of, of confounding factors. Um, and I, you know, I should emphasize, I, I think there are many ways of, of doing this kind of science. Unfortunately, there aren't good models, as you may know, of, of periodontitis or even of oral, um, human oral communities, microbial communities. Um, I think this can be done better. I, I haven't had a chance to talk about ways in which certain variables can be controlled or at least inspected more deliberately, but that's going to have to happen. You're right. It's incredibly daunting, and, um, and still, I think, you know, at the end of the day, when three different groups are confounded in three different ways and come up with something common, when or if that happens, and I think it does happen, then perhaps you can begin to believe something. You gave some hints about how communities or specific, uh, let's say, uh, species change with diet. But have you looked at how these communities change over time? Or for example, let's say you change your geographical location. Many of us have experienced the uh, travel, like stomach problems whenever we go abroad. So it may seem logical that whenever these communities experience changes over either time or geographical location, they may vary. Have you? Uh, looked at how these communities vary over time or, or over space? It, it, it speaks to the, to the earlier question. Um, no, I don't think we haven't, I don't think anyone has in the kind of way that we think can be done, should be done. 
Um, there are, again, clinical opportunities to put people in clinical study centers where they're fed controlled diets. Other factors are controlled. They're certainly not moving around the globe the way they normally might um, or taking medications wantonly. But even those things are hard to control sometimes. But that's the kind of, of clinical study that I think would be extremely valuable, has not yet been done with these sorts of tools. There have been efforts to understand um, uh, place of, of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, living, you know, where you live in, in the world, and, um, and, and nothing coherent emerges. I, again, I think it's, it's confounded in that case. But some variables are more approachable, I think, than others.